Okay guys, I could not help myself. I've been watching this truck for sale online for a little while now, and I just had to go take a look. I went, I looked at it, I test drove it, and wouldn't you know, it broke down on the test drive. So I did what any sane person would do at that point. I made an offer, I grabbed a trailer, and I towed it home. Let's see if we can get the 78 Power Wagon back up and running again. I think she's beautiful. In today's video, we're gonna take apart this carburetor and see if we can't make this thing run correctly. We had a trailer at home, so we're gonna try and take this carburetor apart. It's a Holly two barrel, completely clean it. We'll also look at some of the electrical system um, just for any major things we can find. And hopefully that carb rebuild will really help this thing run and idle so we can drive it around and figure out what else might be wrong with it. The good news is that everything appears to be pretty much stock. I mean, there's certainly some things that have been changed over the years, but I'm not seeing a ton of really odd additions. Now, this is also my first Mopar, so maybe I'm looking at this all wrong, but for the most part, it seems to be all there. We're gonna go ahead, we're gonna pop off the air cleaner. I'll show you why I know this is a Holly. It's pretty self-explanatory. And then we'll see how many tools you need to actually remove the carburetor from the intake manifold itself. I learned this is a 360, so this is a Mopar LA Series 360. Uh, in the 360 for this year for a truck, you could have basically had two two-barrel options, either a uh, Rochester or a Holly. This one is obviously a Holly because it says it there on the front. And then also, if you look at some of these numbers down here and decode those, this is a 2245 Series Holly, and there's a ton of great literature online for this. The rebuild kit for this is about half of what it would be for the Rochester. It's only about $23 for a rebuild kit. We picked one of those up from our local O'Reilly, and now we're gonna look at what we all need to disconnect in order to get this off the vehicle. There appears to be some different things which have been disconnected over the years. I think this is some sort of throttle solenoid or potentially something called an OSAC valve. Um, at first glance, I thought I had a major vacuum leak here, but actually these lines are all just routed together and this isn't, as far as I can tell, hooked up to anything. There's no electrical connections. I couldn't find any stragglers sitting around there. So I think this was disconnected at some point. In order to pull the carburetor, I believe we're gonna have to remove the choke right here, the throttle linkages over here, the fuel line here, and then the hold down screws. And hopefully they should just pop right out. A couple more vacuum lines. We've got a line going to our distributor for our advance. We've got a brake booster in the back. This line can stay put. It does look like there's some cracks on that line. I know it's hard to see because of the sun. Take care of everything where it all came off so you make sure you get it right back in the same spot. Along the way, found another issue. It seems to be very tight. This seems to be loose. And I see some dampness around here. So we may be getting questionable fuel flow into the carburetor due to a leak right here. One of the symptoms that I was noticing, by the way, I've gotten the carburetor off. It was as easy as those four bolts. They are three eighths of an inch. Carburetor comes right off. Here it is here on the ground. Uh, beneath it, there is a spacer. And I assume, having messed with a lot of Edelbrocks, that Mopar realized, I know that's a Holly, but I think Mopar realized that the heat coming up from the manifold, it's a cast iron manifold, can boil the fuel in the bowl. So that gives you an insulator between the hot manifold and the carburetor, which is always a good thing. So we definitely wanna make sure we reinstall that. Some things I noticed when I got everything apart. We've got a vacuum tree back here. And if I come in, you can see this is supposed to be covered, right? It's literally falling off in my hand. So definitely a vacuum leak there. And then this entire fitting itself is actually loose. So we're gonna disconnect all these hoses tighten that back up, likely put a little bit of thread sealant on there. And uh, that should really help, I think, making this thing seal up properly and get much better vacuum because we were only seeing 15 inches of vacuum on the gauge. And as far as I know, this is a stock motor with a stock camshaft. It should be well over 20 inches of vacuum. And I bet you between potentially a leaking carburetor to intake manifold seal and that, is where we were seeing quite a lot of our vacuum leaks. The rest of these hoses though, are like, honestly in pretty good shape. So um, nonetheless, I'll, I always like to get in here and replace stuff. So I'll probably replace hoses. Um, we're gonna also replace the PCV. We've got a new one of those, but let's get this carb disassembled. We can clean everything up and then start replacing some hoses before we put it all back on. And I bet you this thing's gonna run a lot better. 
Okay, one thing I will say with the disassembly, you can look up Holly 2245, that's the model number, uh, disassembly instructions online, and there will be a singular sheet. It's got a few pages, actually. It does a decent job, but Mike's carburetor parts, they're online, and they have a free PDF that you guys can download. I'll link it below um, in the description. That was super useful. Uh, basically, the big thing is the carburetor consists of three parts. So it's like the, the air horn or bowl cover, whatever you want to call it, the carburetor assembly and the throttle body assembly. I highly recommend that when you take everything apart, follow the instructions, put everything in bags and label the bags based upon the number in the instructions so you know exactly how it came apart. Once you get it apart, you do want to soak it and clean it. I used a mixture of simple green and water, but not just any simple green. You want to use the right type that won't destroy aluminum parts. You got to be careful with that because some cleaners will destroy aluminum parts. Um, I only let them soak for about 30 minutes, cleaned everything, blew everything out with air, rebuild it with a $20 rebuild kit, and then you see me installing it right here on the car. Well, this sucks. Got the carburetor back on last night, all rebuilt. Working at night with the headlamp on, you saw the time lapse going. Wanted to see if it would fire up. Go inside, open the door, no lights, no power, no nothing. So we've got an issue, gotta level the trucks. It's the kind of stuff I'm finding. Not saying that this is the issue, but just gives you an idea of the quality of, you know, 50 years of wiring. So that's coming loose. This is a ground. This is coming loose. This is a ground. Where the ground was connected to the uh, core support was kind of loose. I went and cleaned up one of the grounds down there. So I'm going to try this. I'm going to try one thing at a time and keep checking to see if I get power to come back. I'm going to save you guys some long and agonizing troubleshooting. And I'm going to show you this diagram that I made right here. Don't worry. I will flip it around. I will show it to you on the table. I'll take a screenshot so you can hit pause. This will help you diagnose the no start condition in your old Dodge 100%. I can't take all the credit though. In fact, most of the credit goes to Dead Dodge Garage. Check out Dead Dodge Garage. It's a hard one to say on YouTube. If you have an old Plymouth Mopar, whatever, and you're having an issue, but let me just flip it around. I'll talk through it on the table here. I'll show you where the parts are kind of located on the truck itself. And then we'll see, did it fix all my problems? Is it run, start and drive? Did I buy a lemon? Let's see. Okay, I made this diagram so you don't have to. So I'm gonna talk you through this, then we'll flip the camera around. I'll show you everything on the truck. But let me just talk to you about what happened. This is a very common issue with these old trucks. Like I said, Dead Dodge Garage does an excellent job of really explaining this in better detail than I did. But I took what I learned from him. I found a wiring diagram and I made this up. And let me talk you through what you should look at if your truck or car has a no crank, no start condition. So first things first, we've got everything labeled left to right, starting from the battery. So from the battery, you've got two grounds. You've got a ground going to your core support and you've got one going to the firewall and you've got one lead coming off that you gotta follow. This is the large wire to your starter solenoid. So your starter solenoid has the large lug right here, okay? And you have one line that goes off to the starter itself, okay? You also have the starter solenoid, like trigger wire, whatever you wanna call it, um, next to it, but the one we want to follow is the one that comes off the large lug. So follow the big wire from the battery, the, st the starter solenoid, and then follow that wire as it goes towards the firewall. It's going to go through a fusible link, through a firewall connector, into your ammeter or amp gauge, whatever you want to call it. The right, the right word is ammeter. So your ammeter shows you whether your battery is charging or discharging. You see this a lot on older vehicles. You see volt gauges on newer vehicles. The problem with this design is that all power from the truck or for the truck runs through the ammeter. So basically, if you start, and like I said, watch Dead Dodge Garage's video, I'll post it below. But if you check and you confirm that you can actually get the starter to turn over, like you might think, oh, I've got bad grounds and that's where I started, right? Because that's easy. But if your battery's connected and you've got decent grounds and you can take a screwdriver and as long as this is grounded, now you should know the starter solenoid is grounded through the neutral safety switch, um, but anyways, if, if this is grounded, you can take a screwdriver or a jumper wire and you can jump the line from your starter solenoid to your starter and it'll turn over as long as the engine turns over at that point. And don't expect it to start, um, because you have no ignition, but if it turns over, okay, then your battery is grounded. Your starter solenoid is fine. From there, go to your fusible link. If your fusible link is not burnt up and falling apart in your hands, that's not your problem. Go to your firewall connector. With the battery disconnected, 
disconnect your firewall connector and look at this big red wire, okay? And look where it goes into the connector and make sure it's not all burn up or melted or anything like that. I took some spray cleaner and I sprayed it inside of there. Again, with the battery disconnected, took a brush, wiped it, put some dielectric grease on things, put it back together. If that's okay, go into your car. Okay, this is where it kind of sucks. You're gonna have to take your dash apart and look at your ammeter. Like I said, all power goes through the ammeter. There are two ring terminals on each side. And when I took mine apart, I said, you know what? I can't really tell if this ammeter is broken or not internally. It's not really easy to do that. But I, I could see that one of the terminals was like kind of kinked a little bit. So I bypassed the ammeter. Now, how do you do that? You basically take your two sides that would otherwise go through this and just connect them together. So use one of the posts on your ammeter, assuming it's not literally falling apart, and basically just connect these two wires together, therefore bypassing the ammeter, most likely it will solve your problems. If you have a, you know, you, you open the door to the truck, there's no lights, which have otherwise worked, and you turn the key and you've got nothing. Okay, if you've got nothing, chances are this is your issue. If it's in the unlikely chance it's not, you can go downstream even further, and basically you've got a red wire coming in, a black wire coming out, and then it splits. It goes to your headlight switch, it goes to your electric door locks if you have them, I don't. It goes to the battery side, the, the terminal labeled battery on your alternator. It goes into your fuse panel, it goes to your ignition switch. So all power comes through here and then splits. Um, but this wound up being my issue. Once I connected these things together, we were good. Now I'll flip the camera around again and I will show you this on the inside of the truck so you can see where everything's located. All right, as I promised, I'm gonna help point some things out just so you can familiarize yourself what you're looking at. Obviously, here's the battery. The grounds that I showed you, I showed you two grounds. Just, you know, don't worry about the colors. You have a ground going from the negative side to the engine block, make sure that is secure. And you've got another ground that goes over here to the support up under here. I cleaned that one up, redid some of the connections there. So that is all good. Once those grounds are good, you wanna trace the wire from the positive side, the large one, to this right here, okay? There's an extra one. This is at some point somebody had replaced the old, st old starter solenoid and just put the new one right next to it. But what you wanna know, that right there that I'm pointing at, basically this connection, that is where it comes in. You've got one line there that goes to the starter. Don't worry about that one. It's this guy that you wanna follow. Here's your fusible link. It goes into your harness. That's your harness right there. And from there, it goes in through the dash. I won't be able to show you this in a great detail, but basically it comes in through the underside of the dash and goes up to your ammeter, which is this guy right here. This is fully disconnected and it's still reading in the middle. That was my problem. Once I connected those two, everything was great. So let's see if it runs and drives. After all that work, let's see if it runs. almost made a liar out of me. All right, I got it, I got it. I was cranking, had to give it a little shot of fuel. Once I gave it a shot of fuel, it fired up and ran fantastic. Let's let it warm up, okay? Go drive around, see if it's fixed. We gotta get this thing through emissions. All right, guys, this thing runs like a dream. I just took it through emissions. It passed emissions, no problem. I took it on the freeway. I was cruising 70 miles an hour. It runs, stops, hot starts fine, takes fuel fine, shifts fine. I'm super happy with this purchase, and I think the biggest issue, honestly, was vacuum leaks, that carburetor, and the fact that wiring. If that wiring would have never gotten corrected, this thing would have never run reliably. So I bypassed the amp gauge, okay, and then just did some very basic tune-up. This thing is perfect. Hope you guys liked, enjoyed watching this. This is just the very beginning of this. I'm going to show you way more on this truck. You know, there's a lot of things that have been done to it by the previous owner. They did a good job of keeping it in good running order, but there's still more that we want to check on. We'll check on the brakes. We'll check on greasing all the joints. We'll check on all kinds of stuff. Okay. Cab mounts, suspension. We want to make sure this thing is super safe to drive, make sure it's gotten a good alignment and then just drive this thing around and enjoy it. But we'll do that in the next video on truck and roll. See you guys next time.